Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Gavin Henry, um, still 43, and the CEO of Telco Switch. And here at ShoreVoip, um, Telco Switch acquired ShoreVoip in July last year. Um, I'm predominantly a software engineer slash C level something. And um, I'm a volunteer podcast host on Software Engineering Radio, which I just thought I'd mention because. Um, given Andrew's talk today on DNS privacy, I did a nice show with Bert Hubert from the Open, D Open uh, Power DNS project along the similar lines. So it will back up everything Andrew said. Um, and I'm going to talk about where Sentry Peer came from, what it does, and how you guys can hopefully help um, contributing data and consuming data. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so Sentry Peer. It's an idea that's been floating around in my head for quite a while. Um, some way to get IP addresses of um, bad actors, for want of a better term, and the phone numbers that they try to call. Um, bear in mind, SureVoip is an ITSP, so you'll predominantly get um, a customer's on-site system or a handset compromised, and then you'll start seeing um, calls to fraudulent destinations. But there's usually a long tail lead time before that actually happens. So the idea for Centripere was how can I collect those? How can I um, use that data, provide that data, and consume it? And there's a few different commercial services out there like ThreatStop and the spam houses of the world, but they're all centralized. And I, I just thought, I'm looking for a project to do in my evenings and weekends. Um, I want people to own the data. I want it to be as small and as useful as possible. Um, I want to do some um, low-level networking programming and use C, because I've grown up with C, and um, just looking for something to get my teeth in. So Centripere name came from um, just looking at telecoms on Wikipedia and, and going through that, so it was cool. But I thought, well, how can I make it different? Because there's quite a few open source honeypots out there. Um, you run them yourself, and then you've got to manage the data yourself. And then I thought, you know, if I'm collecting that data, someone else should be able to use it, and vice versa. So we can build up this distributed list um, of IP addresses, which most honeypots seem to do just the IP addresses. Um, but the real meat and the useful bit is the phone numbers they're trying to call. And there's the various different grades of those where they might just test they can get an outside line or they get the right SIP response. These might be normal numbers, but the real money-making numbers for them are the ones that they own or they've done a deal with the network operator um, to get payouts when those numbers are called. And none of the honeypots out there had that. So <clears throat> I didn't want to just write this project. I wanted to make sure it was slightly different. So that's where the, the distributed list peer-to-peer -peer in, came in. And next slide, please. That is the next slide, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so it's different because it's all open source. I wanted to develop in the open. Um, and that's a whole different methodology of writing software where when you get push and publish your changes, you know that other people are watching, or, or hopefully. So it lifts the standard up a bit, not that. We all write bad code anyway, but it's very nice to, to see it out there and get contributions. Um, it's different because you own the data. If you collect it, I think you should have the choice to submit that to a central place or share it with other people. But if you don't want to, um, there's options in there to just run it completely standalone. Um, you can share that data. You can also receive other people's data. Um, <clears throat> in the current version, uh, this isn't there, but there's a flag that someone else has requested where they can search the RESTful API to only return data they've collected themselves on their own network and or query data that's come in from other peers. So you can differentiate and, and grade the quality of the data. Um, a lot of the thought process that went into this before I even wrote any code was is sometimes called analysis paralysis, was choosing the right language, how to do the peer-to-peer -peer part, um, really trying to avoid 
running any infrastructure myself because it's just an open source project. So bootstrapping to figure out where other peers were. Um, but a lot of these things are already solved in the BitTorrent networks and things. So a distributed hash table is what I went for, which is the DHT. Um, and there's various open source ones out there I could copy, but I went for a, um, an established project that I'll touch upon shortly. Um, so the replication, so this is where you're running a node, um, you get a probe, um, you have the choice to reply to that probe or not. The, the initial probes will just be harvesting, you know, what they've tried to do, whether it's a, a SIP options pack, packet or an IP address that you want to collect. But until you actually rep reply to that SIP packet, you don't get really any other data. And I discovered that during our pro prototyping stage, which is in the repository, just a Perl standalone SIP proxy um, that I did. And that's when they can see that you're alive and they'll start doing um, more probes. And, and the prototype actually fell over because I just got so many packets when they were trying to make calls and then incrementing the numbers they were trying to get through. Um, so it was, it was a good experiment. And, and the replication is best effort. So it's not like I'm using raft protocols or they um, nominate who's going to be the master for the data. It's just each pair will pop a JSON blob on the distributed hash table. If you're online, you'll get it. If you're not, you won't. Um, because the data is only useful if it's a certain age. Um, but again, you don't need to share or receive that data. You can just build up yourself. And once you've got that data, how do you want to use it? Um, off the bat, we've got a REST API, so you can query a phone number and you can query an IP address. Um, you can run it yourself anywhere you want on your own network, hosted somewhere. Um, I've had a contributed Terraform recipes to put on AWS. Um, I'll touch up upon um, how else you can run it shortly. But the, the design there is that you would put some type of logic into your SIP proxy or your um, SBC where you can just dip a phone number um, or an IP address in real time um, when that phone call comes in. And it's not to build a lot of confusion because this appeared on Hacker News as well a couple of months ago, was that this is going to block, you're going to use it as a block or on an allow list. It's not as... Yes or no, you know, black or white, Boolean is that. It's really to give you an indication, which I'll touch upon in another slide, um, that you may have something compromised either from a customer CPE or somewhere on your network or, you know, you get a heads up that some of the um, numbers and probing information that Centripeer is seeing either on the nodes you're running or from the peer-to-peer -peer network that you may well get um, some fraud soon. So you can act on that, you know, you can throttle things, you can send alert into your uh, monitoring systems, etc. Uh, next slide, please. So this was a big release. Um, on the 29th of March, I put in the peer-to-peer -peer bit. Very excited about that. And that's that's the real differentiator about the whole project. So that's there now. A few talks that I've done are just talking about this coming, but it's actually there now. You can go and download and install it. Um, just run it on your own network and do a SIP probe with something like SIPSAC or anything and see it appear on the other one replicated. And I, I've tried to sanitize as much and check as much of the JSON that comes in as possible. So we're not just accepting anything willy nilly. Um, Next slide, please. So a bit about the technology behind it. As I've touched on before, it's written in C. Um, a lot of people said, oh, you could have used Rust um, or any memory safe or other languages, but I've grown up with C in the open source world. All the things that I use and love in the VoIP world, they're in C, um, and I just wanted to do it that way. Um, there's different decisions around that. And adoption-wise, Excitedly, it was adopted by Deutsche Telekom's Teapot Honeypot project, which is a, a beautiful distribution that has all sorts of different honeypots and analytics and GUIs 
all siphoning data into Elasticsearch for nice dashboards. So that was really good and a, um, a real fun Friday night collaboration with Marco over there because he wanted the JSON logging so he could pop that into Elasticsearch and the Elk stack. So that was um, a sort of thing where someone asked you for, free, for a feature, you have fun doing it, and then it was committed in live. So that was brilliant. And an even bigger bit of news for me that got published this morning is that Kali Linux, the um, penetration Linux distribution, have just published the package um, this morning. I saw the ticket for that. So in the next version of that, you'll be able to download the Kali Linux, Kali Linux distribution and Century Peer will be included. Um, I had grand ambitions of writing everything from scratch, but I didn't want to do a lib for SIP parsing. A lib SIP 2 OSIP2 is about 20 years old now and very stable, so I went with that. Um, everything's tested as much as I can. There's automated tests and building and um, memory checks and everything there. The data is local, so it's SQL Lite. So you can connect to that with any library you want and, and pull the data apart. And the distributed hash table is OpenDHD, which is a really good project. Um, you can actually sign the data or encrypt the data on the distributed hash table as well, which will be the next stage for us. So we can do some uh, validation and integrity checks. So if you decide to run this on your own network, you can make sure you're only pulling in data that you've uh, contributed yourself. Um, Web GUI is a work in progress, and the main things I've been focused on is the REST API. And then next is a proper SIP endpoint proxy where you can do a SIP query to get a yes or no rather than using an API. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the um, dashboard from the Deutsche Telekom teapot project. Um, they just fired that up, and I was planning on building this, and I thought, well, if they can just do that and, and you can download it as an ISO. I might drop the web GUI because that's far much uh, much better than I could ever do. But that will break it down to the type of SIP pings they've done, where it's come from in the, in, the, in the world, all sorts of stuff. And you can use that how you want. I just really want to get this data in people's hands so they can uh, process it and chop it any way they like. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is uh, debug mode on the command line of what um, a bad actor looks like an application. So this is the, the key value bit that I pull apart and then I save it on the disputed hash table. And then you'll get a callback that says success and that's there. It's permanently stored on the disputed hash table. So when you come online, you should get a flurry of data coming in and then you get caught up. So it's still best effort, but you should be pretty in sync with what's around there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, it's multi-threaded. Um, I had a contribution for a fail to ban request, so anything that you log, and also that comes in over the distributed hash table from another peer, goes into syslog, so you can use it for fail to ban. I'm not sure why some SIP infrastructure would be completely public like that, um, but obviously if you're running an ITSP, it will be, so it's, it's a good way to do it. The most up-to-date thing is on Docker Hub, so you can just pull it down, do a, um, a Docker run, and everything's got environment variables, so you can uh, even switch the SIP section off and just run it as a, a node with a REST API that pulls in data from the distributed hash table. You don't need to run the SIP part, and you don't need to reply either if you just want to have it sitting there collecting data. Um, you can install through Homebrew, um, this Debian, Ubuntu, and Alpine Linux packages, and I pretty much do release every month. Uh, next slide, please. That's a blob of JSON, what it looks like. So there's quite a bit of information in there. Um, I also logged the destination IP, which is, I'm not too sure if that will stay because that will publish where you're running the node. I might give you an option to block, block that out because then that leaks where you're running things. But I would advise us running on public IPs anyway. Uh, next slide. So we run a bootstrapping node at bootstrap.centripeer, which will generally always be there. Um, I added a command line parameter over the weekend so you can point it at your own bootstrap node and run it yourself. Centripeer itself is a peer to peer node, so you can just have another Centripeer there. Um, and there's quite a few different options to switch off and enable things that you want 
by default, it just sits listening to zip packets. It doesn't reply, so it's quite safe out of the box. Um, next slide, please. So this was the old argument between Go with C and Go or Rust or something and the pack engine and the community around the project. Um, I had to develop an Alpine Linux one because I wanted a, a slim Docker container, <clears throat> which was great fun. I really enjoyed that. I worked with the Alpine Linux team, so it's in Alpine Linux now. Um, I built the Debian package but, and the Homebrew one, but not only for Centripere, but for any library that I needed, which is OpenDHT being the main one for peer-to-peer. -peer. It's not really up to date on Debian for the C bindings that I need. So I've helped and worked with the team there um, to get the C stuff up to speed, which has been great fun. And, and this is the beauty of open source. You know, you're taking people's libraries, but you're also contributing back. And it's a, a beautiful ecosystem. Um, next slide, please. And out of the blue, I got invited to join the OpenDHT uh, team on the GitHub repository, which is really nice and a good validation that um, I'm, I'm helping and, and, and contributing. Um, so it's not like full commit access, but it's enough to move the things that I like and need and um, help with their testing. I help build some of their continuous integration and um, other GitHub actions to make sure anything we're doing gets as tested as fully as possible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is this pretty much the last slide, uh, so we'll have plenty of time for questions. So I've tried to do a lot of marketing about it just to get people to use it, mainly to test it. I just wanted some people to test it. And this was a, an email to me from the Nanog mailing list, um, a big university in the States. So they just use VoIP. Um, they're not a provider. Um, so they were just wondering if Centripure would be of use. Um, so the main two points there would be um, you can collect numbers yourself if you're running it, and you also see phone numbers that other nodes have collected. Um, and the scenario where that would help you is if you got your Cisco staff or whatever it is or put a proxy in front um, that could dip into the Centripere API, you would know potentially if you've got a device compromise on the network and it's probing around, um, the traditional voicemail fraud where somebody misconfigures their voicemail system, you can dial into a DDI, hit the pin, and then do a press asterisk or one to call back that caller ID. And the forcers usually make sure that caller ID is one that they make money from and they receive calls. So that number would potentially have been collected by another peer and will get return a, you know, a 200 OK that's been seen. Um, a desk phone or some other device might have been hijacked and that account is being used to to test phone calls on these numbers which would appear through your gateways um, so that would give you a notification or send some heads up before you actually get a bill for these calls so you can lock it down or someone is you know innocently calling a number that is a premium rate number and century peer has collected it seen it and returns a response on the api um, for that uh, last slide, please. So hopefully you've enjoyed that and maybe I'll get some stars on GitHub or some people running some nodes now that peer-to-peer is there. Um, I really just want some testers to run it, get some ideas, you know, file some issues, see if you can build it okay. It's a package as well as, well as I can at the moment. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed that and it's given you some ideas of what other protocols that I want to... Uh, that you might like to see, because I can see this as a distributed list um, that collects IPs or other data for not just SIP. That, that's where I want to take it. Um, so we're all collecting and contributing data that you use not just as a blacklist or a whitelist or block or deny, using the proper terms, but it enhances our notification systems that something's going on. Thank you. It's Gavin Henry from Shorevoip. Right, thanks very much, Gavin. Um, so we've got, we've got plenty of time for questions. So if, uh, any questions in the room? Someone's coming up to the mic. Yeah. And if you want to come up to the mic, just you know, keep a bit of distance between each other. Um, but Cathy, you're already here. So remote questions from Cathy? 
So I have a question from E.S. Daniel who asks or says, Sentry Peer is cool, smiley face. My question is whether or not a plugin architecture has been considered, i.e. make SIP a plugin and then plugins for other protocols or services could be added easily. Yeah, that's where I was going with next. Um, I just took the project in little chunks to get the SIP part running, um, designing the database and the APIs and then bottling on the peer-to-peer -peer bit. Chats on the UK NOF mail list, which has been really helpful. Um, some private emails through that, whereby you know, other protocols would be contributed. And, then, and Because it's C, there's quite a lot of projects out there um, that have a plug-in architecture already. So it's something that I just need to do a bit of research on and see. But that is, yeah, yes, that is where I'd like to go. And there's loads of other projects I can look at to see the best way to do that, whether it's bindings for Lua, Perl, Python, or what have you, or it's C, C um, modules. Um, so if you've got some pressing protocols you'd like to see, you know, open an issue, ideally do a pull request and do it for me. That would be amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Any more, any more remote questions? OK. Um, we've got a couple of, of uh, in-room questions for you, Gavin. Hi, okay. uh, my name is Lee Howard from IPv4 Global by Hilco Stream Bank. Man, that's a lot of words. Um, the, so this is a really interesting project. I really like what you're doing here. Um, what I'm wondering is, as I, as I think about how addresses now move around the internet, um, you showed in your JSON structure, you showed, you know, you do have a date there. You mentioned, you know, data, data is only useful of a certain age. What I don't know is if there's, if there's sort of best practices around um, how, how much to infer based on the, the data received from a given IP address over what period of time, if there's a natural decay of the, of the usefulness of the data, or if there's some way to say, and maybe, maybe it's I need to put up at my, own, uh, my own peer and say, no, no, this has moved and there's, there's more information that I can provide about it now. Yeah, that was my main um, concern about some of the centralized yeah. um, projects like this where they make that decision for you they receive all the IP addresses, which looking at the list of data, I've got about a gigabyte of data since Christmas. They're all cloud IP addresses, you know, so they'll come and go when people reuse those IPs. Um, but I've been working pretty closely with the CrowdSec project, which um, is another open source project. And they've been considering running the nodes and distributing the data. But how they do it is they have um, kind of like a reputation scheme where if certain nodes that they trust that have been contributing data for a while submit those IPs, then they have a sort of higher rating than ones that have, someone's just appeared, submitted it and disappeared because that could be trying to poison the pot, you know. Um, so I think bring in some type of grading or something like that, especially uh, weighting things that you've discovered yourself. Um, but again, for the set part is the, it's the phone numbers that carry the real weight of, because that's what um, costs the customers and the operator money. Um, so yeah, uh, any ideas or things that you can point me at, or things that you've seen done um, the yeah. way you'd like to see it would be great if you opened an issue. I, I like that idea, that, that makes sense. The idea of, I also can imagine, but this is more for the people who are using the data more than the people who are collecting and sharing it. The idea of potentially decaying the information over time and putting less weight on information that's been gathered, unless you see a new hit, and then of course you would pop it back up and say, "Oh, now it's you know, oh no, this this is really consistently being used for this," and, and that's true, you know. And I see your point about phone numbers, but I was also thinking about adding additional protocols too, and it may it may pertain more in when you when you add other protocols. Anyway, really interesting project. I, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just add about Open DHT. Um, there's a lot more in there that I'm not using. Um, but when we save a record on the distributed hash table, it's marked as permanent. But if your node goes down for a certain time, it will expire and be removed. So it is kind of a living collection of live information. So you can do it bullion-wise like that, just delete the record when it expires. Or we do some, some type of weighting or reputation thing. But then that pushes it into... Um, you know, web of trust thing, who, who decides that the IP is good or not. 
um, you get into all sorts of attacks for poisoning things as well. People just fire up things and chuck in IPs and put in the competition's IP and stuff like that. That's why I don't want people to treat it as a an allow or deny list completely. It's really a sense of intelligence around it. Hi, uh, Craig Allen in the room, uh, OpenNMS. So it's kind of a related question to the question uh, that was asked previously about uh, people poisoning the, the information in the stack. Um, how would somebody uh, quickly rescind uh, a, a telephone number if, if somebody had actually poisoned the stack with a telephone number? How would somebody go in and tell you, actually, this is a real number and somebody's trying to take me off stream? Well, that is, moves us into like the spam house model. And that's why spam house is successful because you can go and you know, request an unlist. Um, so the emphasis there on allow and deny lists um, would be that if a number's in there, it's just to notify something. I wouldn't want you to just block a call to that number because that's exactly what you've just described. You need a way to get it out. So whether um, when we switch to signed data and then if you've requested a poll based on signature who submitted it, then I think that would allow you to push and pull or delete anything you want because you've put it on the DHT. Thanks. It's your own one. Um, running some centralized thing where you can request something to be removed, I think would be the next stage, but that needs resources and moves it into a commercial type of thing, unless it's done by volunteers or something. But again, open an issue with some ideas, that'd be amazing. Thanks. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, that's the last of the in-room questions. We've got just a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to abuse the fact that I'm standing at the microphone and ask you one really quick question. I think I missed it. Well, it wasn't in the slides, or if it was, I missed it. Um, do you publish somewhere about what kind of compute power I need to run this? Can I just spin it up with, like, one vCPU and half a gig of RAM, or do I need something a bit more? Yeah, it uses about 500K of RAM that I've seen so far. Um, it's a very tiny Docker container, probably the best bet to, to use. Um, it only runs on 64-bit at the moment, just because I've picked 64-bit int in case the data gets massive. I can change that. Um, but yeah, it doesn't use much at all. The, it, it uses quite a bit of bandwidth that I need to do some measurements on um, when the DHT is running, because there's a bug at the moment where when it values expire, um, there's a bit of churn. So I'll put them back on and expire them. That's something I'm working with Adrian from the Open DHC project. Um, but that actually killed me watching Netflix and iPlayer when that was happening in the house. So I had to switch that bit off. So there's a bit of work to do of, of the amount of UDP packets that come through because the DHC is all UDP. Okay, um, cool. Thanks very much, Gavin. Thanks for presenting. No problem. Uh, Hopefully that catches you up a bit as well. Yeah, cool. So yeah, thanks very much to Gavin.